So anyway, anyway, can I start? Yes, no. please. <laughs> yes. Okay. So fun fact: this is the first time I'm presenting with Kiho. Okay. Yeah. Because okay. yeah, I don't want that. Huh? I'll say it, right? Because I don't have the time to do proper slides, you know. Because she strong on me last minute. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, what I'm going to talk about is about design type principles with typography. So um, it's going to be quite simple um, from where I started. There are four principles um, from where I'm referring to. This is the, the book where it's, it wrote, it's Robin Williams' book on design for non-designers. So this was one of the books where I started reading when I started learning design a few years ago. Then no one comes right? Hmm? Yeah. <laughs> look you. Well, you have to know, I just <laughs> took a keynote thing and then just... I know I'm massive. And then it, it looks okay here. Hey. Yeah, great. Okay, okay. great. Hey. Alright. So anyway, um, it's from that book called Design for Non-Designers. Um, it says there are four principles in total. Repetition, contrast, alignment, and proximity. So when we think of design and this four principles, right? We only we usually only think about in terms of design and big, big, great, great stuff. But it actually relates a lot to typography and you know um, microspaces a lot. So what I'm gonna do today is to go through the four principles, then so go through the four principles, and then we're gonna see how it applies to typography on a slightly macro or a micro level. So first one is repetition. Um, anything can be repeated, so repetition breeds familiarity. This is why uh, there are some typography principles, if you're uh, you familiar with them. Um, it's called vertical rhythm, and sometimes we use this modular scale. So basically, typefaces, font weight, font sizes, color, height, uh, line, and shapes can be, can be repeated, and they should be repeated as many times as possible to create that sense of familiarity. So just to illustrate, right, if you just see one circle in the middle of nowhere, you start thinking, why is this circle here? Like, what does it do? What is it? Then if you, if you see more circles, you get more familiarized with that circle and you think of the lesser. By the time you see one whole jingling of circles, you think it's just a background. That's nothing much. That's how familiarity works. The more you see something, the more you get familiar, the more you can focus on, the for on anything else. So repetition in typography is used in four places, um, modular scale, vertical rhythm, um, font sizes, and typefaces. So modular scale, if you are unfamiliar with it, I'm just throwing terms out there. So it's just like a, it's a typography scale, and each variation in size actually should probably be Because you're blocking the project. OK. So man, yeah, we had a resolution, I have no idea why, but... 320 by 240, right? Uh, no idea. You want to adjust it? It's, I think it's fine. I hope. My mum would... My mum would love this presentation. Yeah. I can read the words on the screen. <laughs> so basically for modular scale, if you take a look at this, and this, and this, and this, it's just a ratio of 1.5. So... Oh, why not go? Sorry? I didn't go to the ratio. There's an option for now that this, too. You can, you can choose yeah. your ratio here. But basically what modular scale is, is that this number, uh, the, the, the relationship between this, these two numbers is that one is 1.5 times the other. And then repeats and repeats. So that repetition brings into modular scale and that's how, if you use, if you use modular scale, you kind of have somewhat of a rhythmic font size, which is why it kind of looks better. Well, if you think about you, you can justify that you should either use the, the square root of 2, because you actually look at the area. So what? And not the size. Oh. Yeah, but that's not... Uh, well, there's a lot of things you can think about. If that's the common ratio is not the only ratio. It's yeah. Only the you can use a ton of ratios, you can, you, can, you can choose the line height and play around with the repetition anyway. So the main focus here... Oh! Oh my! Oh, where's my slides now? Huh? Keynote! Damn it! I forgot I, I did it in Keynote. And I hit the contrast here. 
Okay, anyway, for vertical rhythm, it's just basically you are going to repeat the, the white space in your website with a specific amount. <coughs> so that, that white space is repeated. It can be half of that, it can be twice of that, so you vary that repetition. Um, consistent font sizes, well, we all know this is kind of one of the best practices. You set maybe H1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and you reuse that H1 to 6 throughout, and you don't introduce 27 font sizes into your website. And probably the, the best example would be to max use two typefaces. Because the more typefaces you have, you just break that repetition. So this is how repetition is used in typography. And next, contrast. So there are three main ways to contrast. You can contrast with color, size, and shape. So the first way is to contrast with color, with size, or with shape. The basic idea is that when you're using contrast, um, if something is contrasting, you'll catch your attention immediately. So whenever you, want, when, whenever you contrast, you want to insert a like, huge contrast, but not very small contrast, because it kind of gets you the other way. So if you take a look at this, it's a little bit odd, but this is slightly lighter than the rest. Or if it's just one slight little bit off in alignment, then it catches you very, very easily, and you can't really move on to the rest of the image. So it's just annoying. Annoying, yeah, mm -hmm. that's the word. And you can use uh, multiple methods to add contrast. So like this, we change the color. If you change the shape as well, it's even more contrasting. You can see the star much faster than you see the circle. And the first way is the best way to control the things. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely, yeah. You can show designers with typeface cloning at all. Except you better if you put it somewhere off center because then it takes a bit longer to pass and then I'll be even more annoyed because it looks less yeah. attention. Yeah. Best way to show designers is <laughs> the circuits one pixel. Yeah, just, just make it a little to the left by yeah. one pixel. Oh, sorry. Actually, I think I had that. What? <laughs> Come on. Can you see that? Six dollars. Mm. There's more space in there. Yeah. Does contrast apply to slides as well, Zell? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> uh, but I'm just too lazy for this one. Don't, don't know why I asked. I did it quickly. So, anyway, um, for contrast and typography, there are three thing, main things that we want to look out for. The first one is, um, I mean, what we use it, I mean. The first one is model scale, because if you insert like a bit a large number of um, ratios between each number between each step in a modular scale then you generally have that contrast immediately so don't try to use like 12 and 13 pixels or 12 and 14 pixels but add more variations so um for colors you want better contrast than this definitely <laughs> and for typefaces if you want to pair typefaces together make sure they contrast each other like a sans serif and a serif, and not two sans serif. So this is kind of how you use um, type contrast in typography. And these are just examples. I'm sure there are much more than I can think of right now. The third one is um, the third principle is alignment. Alignment is pretty easy to explain because if you just take a look at this image, it speaks everything about alignment. So on the left is very very neat, and on the on the right is just messy. So, notes about alignment is that um, alignment reinforces familiarity that is provided by repetition. Because if you take a look at this thing again, like, it's repeated anyway, right? But you feel more, you feel better with this one because it's more orderly. And we kind of need order in our lives. That's a Singaporean coming. If you're a physicist, then you see the pronoun order. Yeah. If you're a Muslim, I think some websites need a little bit more. <laughs> yeah, definitely, definitely, but not like that. But so if you, if you, for example, would repeat the same or similar text uh -huh. and perfectly align it, then you confuse it. Yeah, I mean, actually, it works well here because it's actually so many variables the same. It's the same amount of circles in the same color, they're all the same size, mm -hmm. and it's just one dimension is off, which is the position. Right? And in, in that sense, it actually works. It actually works, yes, but I'm just comparing between the two. Yeah. We're just trolling you. I know. <laughs> I shall let him troll me. 
So alignment also affects contrast, like this is the one I showed you earlier. <laughs> Best way to throw people and get people mad. I, I think it, for, for non class screen, so I at least see that this screen is not perfectly cloud, which means that you need two pixels or three pixels to, to notice because unevenness of the screen already dominates the effect. Yes. And you probably need a smaller computer so you can have a look at my screen over here. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Can we talk about ancient Greek architecture yet? <laughs> <laughs> okay, it's not this fast. That's really good. <laughs> okay, anyway, um, for alignment and typography, we generally think about uh, either vertical alignment or horizontal alignment. Vertical alignment, vertical alignment is what we usually talk about, and that is the left right center justified thing. In general, justify to the left and don't, don't ever justify text on the web. Because justifying text on the web leads to things like this. See that space in between thing? So it's harder to read. Now, for this, um, I, I think, um, to be more correct, justification makes sense only if the text is long enough. No. Justification makes sense only if it doesn't, it, it doesn't disrupt the reading experience as much. And why does it not disrupt the reading experience? Um, Unfortunately, um, it doesn't disrupt it. It's okay, I'm, I'm going to interject about yeah. this. Um, because traditionally, for traditional printing for letterpress, uh, I'm not sure how many people are actually familiar with the actual printing process, but it, how, how people actually set type is they would set the type by hand. So there, there are several types. Um, I think linotype machines were really popular for newspapers um, in a, about probably in, all the way up to probably the 70s or 80s before they started moving to um, photo, so-called cold type. But so what they would do is they would actually cast the individual letters and they would set, they would set these letters by hand and then place them to send them in for a uh, letterpress printing and uh, what they could do because you could actually control the space between each letter and each word for every line and when people tried to recreate this on the web they actually tried to write an algorithm that would do that but I think what they realized was that it was too expensive to compute or something so there were two algorithms the one that we have now that is not really very well that's why he says don't use it because that is that's the so-called lazy algorithm there was a smarter algorithm but i think they weighed the pros and cons in terms of performance and they can't the other one so that's why we are left with this not so good justification algorithm but but i think when they came up with justify they did have a better algorithm but it just didn't make it yeah but the, the thing is that if line is long enough then you don't see the difference you do see that because of the statistics. If there are enough words, the spaces will be inserted between words within the same line. So whatever the difference, we will not see it. The good algorithms they also uh, change the curtains, like yeah. yeah. yeah so th th that's the thing. If the line is long enough, it doesn't matter. And still, if, if it's short, then you see the detail. Yeah. For the you, you, you do yes, you do you do make a point. Oh, yeah, you spend the columns that are only what about twenty characters wide. Yeah, yeah with twenty characters, you will set up But you can get away with the justification of that. It is. I read a, a paper on um, how the human mind interprets characters and words, and justification is more complex to uh, wrangle than not, because even when it's subtle, the change of the coding from one line to another and the spacing takes a bit more processing. So you're still able to read it. So a bit more this is when, when the, the difference is perceptible. If, if the line is long enough, then you will have very minuscule differences between words, yes. between lines, and you will not perceive them. Statistically, you make sense, but I think you will raise another point about the ideal line length. And then you'll realize that that's, yeah. why, that's where we get stuck, because the ideal line length is not long enough for justification to look good with the current algorithm that we have. Yeah. Strangely speaking, Carry if you're thinking about justification on the web, um, you don't want to use it for longer line lengths because of the way we read. But if you are concerned about like space and you're concerned about how that site actually looks, so justification is very good for creating a graded grid-like uh, column layout, like newspapers. So for that, you, 
instead of longer line length, you actually have shorter lines. And that is actually slightly better, but we don't really want to do it on the web as well. Yeah. Okay, next. So this is one thing that most people don't think of. And this uh, is about horizontally aligning multiple columns of text. Mm -hmm. Because it's just freaking hard. So if you take a look at the, the top one, uh, where's my mouse? I can't even see my mouse. Yeah. Okay, so anyway, like these two are not aligned, but this part is aligned, for example. And you don't really see multiple columns on the web because it's just hard to pull off. Plus there are tons of things you want to think about. Like even if you read newspapers, they don't even make the the uh, lines align properly. But if it, if it does align properly, it's just a better reading experience because it's just ordered. So it's just it's like that. But it's hard on the web because of the way line hikes are handled. I don't want to go into that because it's another big calculation article. Um, the last one, proximity. So proximity is basically the distance between two things. And it can be used to help organize things. So for example, if you take a look at these two pictures. Oh, so <laughs> Yeah. So Valentine's Day special edition. <laughs> <laughs> what day is this? <laughs> Belated. Yeah, too late. Oh, I'm still in SF. Yeah. <laughs> Roll eyes. <laughs> okay, so like you can see the first the, the two orange circles are closer than the two blue circles. That's for sure. So it can be used for organization. Let's say you have this messy block of squares and triangles. You can organize them in this way, and that creates some order. But if you get some white space in between, then you kind of know that the squares are on one side and the triangles are on one side, and they are about to fight. Okay. So proximity in typography is basically just uh, managing the white space. The clearest example of that is you know, some people try to put a H2 and then they put the same amount of white space to the top and bottom of that. But this example can be improved a lot if you just tweak the white space slightly by adding more white space to the top and less white space to the bottom. And with this, the H2 feels more like it's part of that second paragraph and onwards, which is what um, content dividers are there for. So, Example of a white space and uh, of proximity is a list. So the white space between list items should, should be slightly smaller. Uh, and the white space between the list and the paragraph items should be equal. So it just breaks things up slightly. So it's easier to do. Yeah, I'm gonna. <laughs> okay. Fun times. Okay. So, uh, if I can come back to justification. Yes, please. For yes. many people, it may be an aesthetic effect whether it's justified on both sides, yeah, and whether it's properly stretched if necessary. Especially if you wrap the images next to the text, this jagged border will, will be unpleasant. Definitely, the, the jagged border we have present, so you want to think about how you put that images so like, float bright images are not always the best for that example. I think the tricky part is that this, whatever you mentioned, was very, uh, I won't say easy, but it was very achievable when we hand set uh, print. The thing is, I feel what we haven't got to, at least right now, but things may change in the future is that, like I mentioned the algorithms, there is a specification for hyphenation not very well done yet, but I, I know that people working on the CSS are trying to improve this because what, basically whatever you mentioned makes sense and, and has proven to, to work in print it's just we haven't been able to get the technology to recreate what we've been able to do in print but I believe that will change in a few years time because the spec is being worked on and as computing power and browser code gets written better, I think that is an issue that is very, very solvable. And we may be seeing such 
Like maybe a few years later, Zell won't be telling you not to use justification because it has improved a lot. So I think things are think you are not sure, but I, I think things are improving. It's just that one other question with web justification is that you there are so many languages that we are writing with. Um, for most justification libraries that are out there, it, they only justify English. I think. In text. Oh, Latin, Latin text. text. All right. But, but then you mentioned the no, it's not only yeah. Latin text, just English. Like I think okay. if if the line is long enough. I mean, if the line is long enough, you probably don't need that justification in the first place. That you need because you still have a jagged edge. But you will not see the difference between really just and unjust. Like once you have like enough words on the screen on a website, then you would say right, enough words to make the symbols just. Yeah, it's, it's less than it's, it's it's a block of text that you don't enjoy reading. Yeah. So it's it's just the, the case with can read pretty long texts. <laughs> Well, yeah, it it's, long in it's, it's always a difference every time we talk about like you know what yeah. you can read, what you're talking about, what the average person can use. Or not even average. You're looking at the least viable consumer that you want to have. Yeah, here but yeah, I'm, I'm talking about the, the visual effect or the yeah, yeah. effect. It's something you look at. So it's yeah. properly justified. Like yeah. It is a different it's effect. effect. Yeah. And it is used What's in like advertisement uh, to catch the eye. So I would not you know, discard it can you out yeah. 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 If, if you have time to get it very often. Yeah. Yeah. Like on the web, it's not. Yeah, yeah. 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 It's like most of the justification I've yeah. is in print. Yeah. 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 OK, so this is this is my new segment also, oh. because I'm hyping CSS to <laughs> read. And um, 